Okay, recording is on. Okay, let's take a moment to pray together and then we will get started. Can I request somebody to pray with the class, please? Go ahead. Good, I said, we can't hear you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dad, for being such a good class. Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. For you, God, and for you, Lord. Thank you so much. I pray that each one of us understand your heart and also. I pray that you give us wisdom and knowledge and also, Lord, that you pour out your spirit in that on Pastor Ashish as he teaches. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I uh, apologize. I've missed quite a few uh, lectures, but uh, hopefully we'll catch up. And as we move forward, uh, we'll be able to learn some more things. So, um, I uh, I put out a little uh, I, I wouldn't call it an assignment, uh, but I put out something for you to start thinking about for next year. If you're interested, there is no compulsion to do that. Um, just to you know, the things that we are learning in this course, uh, BC. 309, which was on urban church planting, along with uh, what we are learning in 310, which is church and ministry administration. <clears throat> so I want you to think about, and of course pray as, as God leads you, how you can bring those things together and develop a plan uh, for a ministry you may feel God is calling you to start. Right, so this is not a compulsion to do this. It's um, more for if you feel God is leading you to do that. Okay, so that means you you're going to take this learning and try to see how you can apply it in your context, in your area, to whatever God is calling you to do. And one of the things that we will be doing next year is um, actually we are we are, we are launching something in India. Right now, the latter part of this year, and then next year we will open it up to our Bible college graduates. Those are graduating next year. Is uh, if you want, there is no compulsion. Um, you can, you know, we will invite our students to submit a proposal of what they're planning to do, what they feel God called, God is calling them to do, and then they're going to try and help our students, whoever you know, as many as possible, to get their ministries started and you know our goal is to help them at least for the first three years so that you can have a good start and then of course uh, you should be able to go from there on your own uh, if you get a good start you can build on that that's our plan for next year and you know those who want to participate are welcome to it's there's no compulsion it's just our desire to um, uh, to help people get their ministry started because that's the most difficult part <laughs> You know, how do you get something started? But once you get started, then, you know, you can keep building with God's help and grace. Anyway, so keep thinking about it. Now, we are going to, I want to just quickly review uh, what uh, what we started talking about on the practical side of things, practical aspects of church planting. Uh, you know, we've covered all this just to refresh our minds. We talked about the church planting core team, how you prepare from a distance, how you relocate to the site, you plan for your finances. Now we depend on God, but we also do our part of planning and being ready. Uh, finances for the church plant. Uh, you plan for your personal needs. And if you're married, then you need to think about your spouse and your children. Uh, you also plan for the legal and administrative side. You know, so that when you start doing something, everything should be fine legally. We talked about the survey phase, how you survey the city, 
uh, <clears throat> you find your launch area, think about it. You want to, you know, understand your launch area, where you're going to start the ministry, what's around in that place. Then we also talked about the preparation phase, which is you could have some pre-launch meetings. You would be spending time in worship, prayer, intercession for the people. Uh, you pray for your, you know, you understand your target audience. Uh, you connect with them. Uh, there may be people whom God has already prepared for you in that place that you're able to build relationships with them. Uh, you find your launch location where you're going to get your ministry started. And then from there, where else can you grow? How else can you, you know, expand your work for that city or in that region? We also made mention of the house church model. Sometimes you, you may not want to do like a typical church. Instead, you may want to work in a house church model, which is fine. That is also a viable model. <clears throat> then, you know, about the launch itself, some thoughts, you know, you do it only once, do it the way God wants you to do it. There are many different ways that people do it. You go with what God puts in your heart. Your first church service, think about it very carefully. Um, plan for follow-up so when people come, you should have some way of following up uh, with them. So this is where we stopped, right? We're going to pick up here from lesson 12. <clears throat> what I want us to talk about is uh, strategies uh, for urban evangelism, urban missions. So when you are planting a church or a ministry, and we're of course talking about the urban context, um, we need to think of some ways by which we can reach people. Right? And so we, we said, you know, we looked at the example of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 23, where, you know, he said, I, I become all things to all people. Uh, to the Jew, I become like a Jew. To those without the law, I become as though I was without the law, but not without the law for, under the, without the law for Christ. So he stepped into people's worlds. You know, he became what they were so that he could reach them, connect with them. And that this is so important for us, depending on who God has called you to primarily serve and reach. Um, uh, try to connect with those people. They should be able to relate to you. You should be able to speak into their lives and so on. Now, uh, uh, some things to keep in mind is uh, don't intentionally offend people. Right? Uh, in First Corinthians 10, you know, 31 to 33, Paul says, we give no offense. Uh, uh, sorry, this is First Corinthians 10. Let me go there. <coughs> um, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33, Paul says, you know, uh, verse 32, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Verse 33, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. So Paul is saying, you know, I, I'm not here to offend people. But I'm here to please people. That's kind of interesting because we know he also said, I do not please men. You know, that's Galatians 1 and verse 10. Paul says, if I please men, I cannot be a servant of Christ. And yet here he's saying in 1 Corinthians 10, 33, I, I please all men. What is it? What's he saying? He's saying, I'm not here to offend people. I'm here to you know, have good relationships with people. I'm here to relate to people well. The intent is that they may be saved, right? So I want to draw them in. I want to share the gospel with them. So uh, don't intentionally offend people. Of course, they, they may have differing views and ideas and beliefs, all of that, but we try to connect with them and listen to them, care for them, and then lovingly share Jesus with them. And... Um, Another aspect of, of the strategies that we develop is that uh, we want to make sure our strategies don't bring any blame to the gospel, right? Whatever strategies we use, uh, it shouldn't bring, it should be clean, it should be ethical, uh, it should be morally right, you know, uh, in, in, as we reach out to people, there should be no opportunity for blame. So we are not, uh, you know, inducing people, we are not, you know, 
preying on people on their uh, innocence or gullibility. Uh, we are very German, very open in our approach to sharing Christ. So what we want to do is <clears throat> we want to share some, you know, practical strategies, ideas. So I, I am putting these before you as ideas. I'm not saying that, you know, you should do these or this is how you should do it. Now I'm just saying, look, these are some of the things we've done here. And you can, <clears throat> similarly, the Lord will lead you and give you strategies wherever you are working, right? Now, one of the things that, how we have gone about this here in Bangalore is, we've tried to develop strategies for different age groups. So you look at people in your city or in wherever you're trying to reach people, and you look at the different age groups, right? And then you begin to think, you know, how can I reach these different age groups of people, uh, which means I need to know where are these people, where can I interact with them, how can I do that, and what are the strategies to do that? So you can look at different age groups. The other thing you can do is you can develop strategies based on areas of need in the city, right? So, you know, when you do your survey of the city and you say, look, our city has needs. Uh, these are the main needs. And this is what I feel God is calling us to address. Of course, you're not going to be able to address all the needs of the city, but you take one or two or three. And then you say, okay, let's see how can we address these needs. What are the strategies we can have to address that need? So that's one way. You see, you and I start thinking like this, then the Holy Spirit will give us the ideas. We can also think in different spheres of activity. So there are different professions. There are IT professionals, there are doctors, there are educationists, uh, you know, it's different spheres of activity. So then you may say, well, how can we reach people who are educators? What can we do for them? How can we reach people who, you know, are working in a certain sphere of activity? What can we do for them? So as you start thinking along those lines, the Holy Spirit will give you some ideas and you go. Another way of developing strategies is by using the tools that are available. And I, and I mean tools, of course, I'm using, I'm referring to technology, referring to mass media, or even social media tools that we can use to engage with people. And so you can think in, along those lines uh, when you want to reach people in your city in, or wherever you're working. Um, and the most important goal, when we, which we said at the very beginning is that when we make believers, we disciple and equip these new believers so that they in turn can reach more people. That means people reaching people is the most effective way, right? So we can have these strategies, which is good, but ultimately it comes down to people reaching people. That means somebody is inviting a friend or somebody is talking to a friend or somebody is praying for some person. Ultimately, it's people who are going to reach people. So what we must do is we need to have a way by which we constantly disciple and equip our people so that they can influence others, right? So keep that in mind. So let's just go through <clears throat> some of these uh, strategies for different age groups, uh, some of the things that, I, that we were able to do. And, uh, you know, just way for you uh, to start thinking, right? So when you think about children, right? Uh, so, we're talking about kids who will be in school typically till they are 10th grade, they're about 15 or some may stay, you know, or if you include 11th and 12th grades. So you're talking about 17, 18, something like that. Uh, they are in school. And they are a very important part. They, they form part of the 10, 14 window. So this 
uh, this is the age group where they are very open to the gospel and if they make a decision for Jesus, uh, most likely it's going to stay with them for life. So it's a very important age group. Now, you know, uh, for us um, here in Bangalore, uh, we started a program called Catalyst um, that began uh, in 2008. 2008. Um, now it started in actually an uh, unusual way. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily plan for it. Uh, and, and, and again, we're sharing this testimony or this story more of to share that, you know, sometimes uh, things may seem like it happens by accident, but uh, it's God is orchestrating it. So what happened in 2008 was, uh, you know, we were having one of our services in a certain school here in Bangalore, in the north part of our city. We had just asked permission from that school saying, can we use your school to have church service? And they'd given us permission. They gave us a classroom to use. Now, uh, that particular school, they had three locations in Bangalore. So, uh, so one day, what happened? I got a call from the, to the you know, the main person, um, uh, and he, they they actually live in another city. They live in Mumbai, and he happened to come to Bangalore. So he called. He said, "I want you to come and meet me." So I went to meet him, and he said, "You know, how's the church going?" And all that's fine. Then he said. Um, can you do something for us? Can people from your church come and, uh, you know, speak to the students? Uh, you know, basically do scripture lessons for the students. Now, till that time, I had not even thought about that. I, uh, I never even thought of, like, going into schools and teaching scripture to students. But here was an open door. I mean, he's the director of all these schools. They had about hundreds, more than 100 schools around in India. Uh, there are three schools in Bangalore. And uh, he was asking me, you know, can you people from your church come and teach scripture? And uh, and also, you know, talk to our staff and all that. I immediately said yes to everything. I had no idea how we were going to do it. But this was an opportunity. Uh, I, I, I just couldn't say no to. So I just said, yes, we will do it. And uh, then I went, you know, I said, okay, now how are we going to do this? You know, How are we going to send people to go and teach scripture to all these classes in that school? And they had three schools. So he said, you know, all three schools are open. You can start anytime. Uh, so that was the time. And again, so... I said yes, I had no idea how this was going to happen. And it was so wonderful. That was a time somebody uh, sent the resume of, uh, you know, now we know her as Pastor Selena, but her resume came. It was also amazing. Like, I didn't go looking for somebody. Her resume just came to me, it was emailed to me. And um, uh, she had graduated from Bible College. And uh, she had spent some time working with children in school. So she had just the right background. And her resume came. So it was very easy. I just called her into it. I said, see, uh, we have this amazing opportunity. The director has called us. He said, we can start teaching scripture in, in, in three of his schools. And uh, you're going to, I want you to, you know, make it happen. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. You can hire how many more people you want, uh, you, but you have to make it happen. And so, you know, Pastor Selena joined us at that same moment. You know, I, I would say it all happened like within a week. Like the director spoke to me. I said, yes. The next thing is I get a resume in my email. It's a resume of uh, somebody who's done this kind of work and uh, speak to her, interview her, and she joins us. So uh, uh, I just feel that God orchestrated that wonderful opportunity. You know, I, I wasn't planning it. I, I didn't even think about it. Today, we can look back and I can tell you, you know, think about children and all that. But in 2008, uh, it was really God orchestrating that uh, wonderful opportunity. And so the, 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 the Catalyst program started. Selena 
uh, did a wonderful job. She got in a lot of volunteers. She got in, we got in some paid staff and, you know, we started this. Uh, and of course, we had to write our own curriculum. Like, what are we going to teach the children in school? Scripture that we're going to teach from, I think, was grade two um, to grade a, uh, grade eight, and then grade nine and ten. We were teaching like what we call as value education, basically teaching the Bible, but in different things. So it was an amazing opportunity. And then we said, hey, if we can do it in three schools, we can do it in more more schools. So you know, we knocked on some other schools, and they've also opened up for us. And so at one point, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, and again, my numbers may not be very accurate, but you know, I think we were in six schools and we were teaching 20 or 20,000 children every week. That was what Catalyst program was doing. You know, and you can imagine in these classrooms, um, about 80% of the children come from non-Christian homes and they're listening to scripture being taught every week, one lecture per class. And so we were covering 20,000 some students, maybe more than 20,000 students every week in, across these five schools. Um, it was a wonderful work that was happening. And uh, it went on. You know. And those days, we had great testimonies of uh, children uh, giving their lives to Christ. Uh, experiencing Jesus in their lives. Um, but uh, we were also very careful. Um, schools were telling us, you know, you can't distribute Bibles and all that uh, in the classroom. So we'll come and teach scripture, but, you know, you have to be careful about certain things. So we followed whatever instructions we were given by the schools and uh, it, it served, served them well. Now, all of this, of course, came to a stop um, just before the pandemic. Things came, you know, we... We had to stop it, uh, uh, and then, so right now we just like in a very small way starting, but then there are other complications now. Uh, we have, you know, the, the, there's a lot of anti-conversion things happening you know, in, in our city, or I should say even across our nation. So schools are now become a little um, cautious, um, uh, towards having scripture being taught so openly. So things are a little different now. So when I look back, I see that as a window of opportunity that we had 2008 till about 2018, for about 10 years, 18, 19. And we had about a 10 year window where we could really do this. Uh, things are a little different. So some schools, fewer schools are open now and we're still doing it, but in a much smaller scale. Right, so, that was that's been our experience and it, and that is currently our experience here reaching out to children in in the city uh well i just want to just listen to what are your thoughts you know because many of you are from different parts of the world uh, your experience or what's happening in your part of the world may be different uh so just be interesting to listen to you know what are some of the challenges you think children face uh what would what are some strategies that would work in your uh, parts of the world, you know, uh, so just take a few moments, just keep a few moments for people to share, uh, share that. Any thoughts anybody wants to share? Please go ahead. So we're talking about reaching children. Um, so imagine you're, you're starting a church or a ministry and you want to reach children in your city. Uh, you know, how, what are the conditions there? How, what are some opportunities you can see? Uh, feel free to share. So can I share? Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Um, I think um, in in Ghana, one of the opportunities to reach to children is the case of this um, marginalized group, Head Potters. This, um, those who come from the northern part of Ghana mostly come to the southern part for economic activities. And when they come, because um, they are vulnerable, they are low income people, they are unable to take their kids to school. 
So reaching out to these people through education is one of the opportunities that exist um, in Ghana for the the propagation of the gospel. Eventually, when um, we are reaching out to the case, it means that the parents who are also going to follow suit. So reaching out to the kids will also mean you are bringing the parents in, mm. and that will that will spearhead uh, spread the, the 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 nets of um, those that we are bringing in. We are reaching out with the gospel. Mm. Another opportunity that exists is also um, the senior high school. Those senior high school. Um, through school outreach system, we we reach out by organizing revival meetings in the secondary schools. They have they have this days of um, spiritual emphasis mm. in the schools. So, if you are able to discuss with the school authorities, um, your ministry can take charge of. You can have a slot. Um, in the academic term to to do that mm -hmm. and because the students are coming from different background different um areas reaching out to them in a common area means that when they leave the school and go to their communities uh, they are going to impact their communities also mm -hmm. yes yeah, so mm -hmm. so far that is what i want to share thank you mm -hmm. good good very good that's good. It's good to be able to <clears throat> recognize these opportunities and, you know, move into it. That's that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else, any other part of the world, you know, um, uh, what opportunities do you see in your city or where you are to reach children? We're talking about children. How could we do that? And good, good thoughts there from Elisha. Anyone else? Uh, Pastor, me, Charles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Charles. Me, I'm already reaching children, so I do schools ministry. Mm. Uh, on average, I have around 17 schools that I minister in a oh. week. Wow, 17 schools. How do you manage that? Uh, there are some schools that, like on, like on Wednesdays, I have around seven, mm. and on Friday I have five, mm. and then on other days there where I have two, then one like that. So I move mm. from seven to eight to another school, then eight to nine, then ten like that, like that in a day. So. Oh, I do just wow. do ministry, but also on Saturdays, I do the children's home cell, uh, which we call a good news club. So uh, we do the every other week. So I have two of them. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, if we meet on this Saturday, then we skip. As mm -hmm. they skip me, I mean another one on, on the other Saturday, then we also meet the other Saturday like that. That's what mm. I do with the children, but also I prepare camps, the, the Bible camps, and then like I completed the recent one last week, but one, so mm. they are more reaching the children. Very also. nice, very nice, very nice. So you, you, you basically, you, you, you teach them scripture, and that, that's, that's kind of the focus of what you're doing, right? Yes, it is, it is evangelism, it is a discipleship and getting mm. them established in their local Bible believing churches. Mm. Okay, wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? All right. So, um, so you know, that one age, that's one age group that you can think about uh, as far as your you know, reaching out to the city. And of course, the local church, which you're pioneering, will also have, you know, <clears throat> you call it kids' church or children's church that serves the children who, of the families who are coming to the local church. But we're talking about also having strategies that reach out into the city. 
Now, uh, one thing uh, uh, which I think is pretty common around the world is uh, what we call as a vacation Bible school or during the summertime when schools have summer break, um, we, we can conduct these vacation Bible schools. Now, of course, these vacation Bible schools are conducted by churches for their you know, children who are coming to church. But it also becomes uh, a very <clears throat> good opportunity to invite some others who don't normally go to church, not, um, unchurched people, even non-Christians, people from other faith, invite them to come to the Vacation Bible School. And you know, they, they're exposed to the scripture and so on. So the, these are all, all opportunities. And I think we need to constantly look at that age group uh, look at ways by which you can uh, reach children and uh, there are a lot of uh, ministries and resources available. So next <clears throat> we talk about uh, the next age group which is you know we generally will call them youth. Uh, they are you know essentially going to college at this time between 18 to 25 they may be doing the bachelor's program, some may be doing the master's program, but they're all in college. They transition out of school, in college, getting ready for uh, their future professional life. Now, it's important for us to understand the youth, right? Um, in, the, in an urban context. You know, so we would, um, there've been a lot of studies we've done of uh, the Gen Z, the Gen Alpha, and Gen Beta, yet to come people. Um, uh, I mean, they will be studying them, of course, but you know, the Gen Y, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, this, this, this generation. A lot of studies being done, so it's good to you know go look them up uh, and and see what are the characteristics, what are the things that are this this group is struggling with. Um, and uh, then begin to address them in your youth work, your outreach. Right? So, first of all, we should be able to describe urban youth. You know, um, urban youth today uh, could be very different from urban youth of twenty years ago. Right? So, understand what are the youth, the young people. In our day and time, what are they going through? What are their aspirations? What are their you know, apprehensions? What are they concerned about? And then what are the strategies we can develop to reach youth in urban centers? We need to think about this right, constantly. And especially if you're pioneering a church in a city, this age group is very important. You know, now, in a city like Bangalore, we have a lot of youth who come to the city to go to college. You know, they, they, uh, there are many colleges in our city. So there are students who have come from many parts of our country to study. Uh, they come for you know, <clears throat> trail learning to study in these colleges. And so you know, this gives a great opportunity to actually reach youth from many parts of the country because they're coming here to study, right? Uh, so that's, a, that's an opportunity we don't want to miss. Now, here again, you know, uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, uh, the journey we've made. Uh, I went back in, I think this was, you know, when we started as a church, and we were a small uh, church at that time, uh, and I'm going back in time to about 2000, um, 2002, 2003, um, uh, our first event, first youth event, <laughs> uh, I think was uh, uh, in 2002 or three. I forget the exact year, but we did a special seminar on dating and marriage. And this was way back in 2002, 2003, that time, so February of that year. Uh, we, you know, we were ourselves, we were a very small church. We had just started in 2001. So as a church, in, in, in terms of numbers, we must have been just 30, 40 people, something like that. But we had a special seminar 
we rented a, 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 a <clears throat> like a seminar hall in a, a hotel right in the heart of our city. And we said, we're going to have a seminar on dating and marriage. And this was in the month of February, just around February 14th. And, uh, and we just did whatever promotion we could. And I was very surprised. We had about 70 youth show up. Uh, you know, just, I don't know, from where different word got around, 70 youth showed up. And I did a little talk on dating and marriage and whatever, you know. Um, but then that's how we said, look, we are going to start reaching out to youth in our city. The next thing we did uh, this, that same year was we said, you know, uh, we will do some events inside a cafe. And in those days uh, in Bangalore, um, a, a, a chain called Coffee Day was, uh, was just kind of coming up, you know, just becoming, let's say, I would say it's one of those few coffee shop, coffee day, coffee shops, cafes that was coming up. And so, uh, we went to uh, a coffee shop right in the heart of our city. And we said, uh, you know, uh, we want to use this place for two hours. Uh, this was on a Saturday evening, uh, but we will give you business. Guaranteed, we'll give you business of 30 orders. That means we will order 30 snacks, 30 beverage. Uh, we'll give you guaranteed business. Uh, we, we just want to use this place for two hours. We're going to sing some songs and we are going to have a little talk and some discussion. Now, the owner of this particular coffee day, uh, it was in the heart of our city, we call it, it was called MG Road. Yeah, he was more than fine. Do whatever you want as long as you know you give business for two hours. And so we had one person on a guitar. His name was Georgie. So he would be on a guitar. He would just sing songs and choruses, you know, Christian songs, choruses. And uh, youth would just gather, and then we would you know, uh, we would just give a little talk on something from the Bible, and then we would you know we would provide uh, some beverages and coffee, or we would let them order whatever they want: one snack, then one beverage, yeah, whatever, order whatever. And so what happened was we started doing this on Saturdays, and the numbers just kept growing. So we shifted. The coffee day venue to at that time uh, the largest coffee day possible in uh, Bangalore. Um, uh, that was on a, um, so we we used to have and the, the numbers just kept growing. Uh, this coffee day went once a month. Uh, that was our youth outreach, and uh, and I think we hit more than a hundred youth coming together in this coffee day cafe that was the largest one there and then we couldn't it couldn't hold more than that it was just very congested and so on so from there uh, so we did that for almost two years i think to some years and then from there once the numbers hit crossed 100 uh, we then moved into a more formal auditorium hall like thing space so um you know that's kind of how what we did in those early days to start reaching youth by doing meetings in a, in a cafe, very informal. They would invite people and uh, invite other youth. That's kind of how the youth ministry actually started uh, for us. And from then, you know, then it became a little bit more formal. We were meeting uh, in an auditorium and then it, you know, we should call it in those days, Elevates. It was our youth service. We had like a regular youth service that was going on. But then uh, what I, during one of those youth elevates, youth services, once I remember one Saturday, I just felt that, look, uh, instead of having this youth service, why don't we take the youth service into colleges? Because we were having a youth service in, in an auditorium and we were expecting the youth to come, which was fine, but mostly it was a church youth who started coming. But what if we reversed the order and took the youth service into college campuses? So what we did was uh, we, we approached colleges and said, hey, can we do what we're calling a Elevate program in your college campus? 
uh, in your college auditorium for your college youth, whoever wants to come can come. And we are talking about, you know, we gave them the topics and those kinds of things. And uh, to our surprise, the colleges were very open. So I think this was back in uh, 2012, 2012, when we made this shift um, that he said, I, I think it was 2012, 11 or something, somewhere around that time, that we said, we will take these youth meetings into college campuses. We just call them as campus elevates. And we started doing it in Cal College. And, then our, and, our, and our youth used to go, and they used to talk to the college youth. Sometimes there'll be a few hundred. Uh, in some colleges, I think we even had up to uh, 600 people gathered in the auditorium. Uh, and uh, we started doing this on a regular basis. So it became an outreach into these colleges uh, for an opportunity for us to talk to college youth in their campus, in their auditorium. Uh, you know, in some places we had the opportunity to sing maybe one or, one or two songs and then somebody would share. In some places they said no singing, just do the talk. So then people would just go and do the talk. And so, you know, di different colleges had different, uh, gave us permission for different things. But the point was we had this opportunity to bring a message to the college students and then we you know we would get permission to leave our literature at the back so students who they wanted to they could take it and, and explore so that became like an outreach to college students in our city and so again now everything stopped because of COVID, and we're just trying to revive that uh, get that back um, to colleges that are open and then um, along with that we uh, we looked at uh, what we call as um, having small groups, Bible study groups for college students close to their hostel. So these would be campus groups or, you know, Bible studies for them. So that worked to some extent. It was effective in certain, or not, I would say maybe two or three groups were effective. Not, not, it wasn't very big, but uh, one group especially was very effective close to one college campus so that was useful so this has been our experience now we need to rethink how we are doing it uh, how we have to reach youth and one of the things i'll just share this thought and then i'll pause um, i was just re reading a, a, a recent update on you know reaching uh, gen z the the, the current youth the kind of young generation who are probably are in their 20s, um, that they are not interested in hype. They're not interested in you know, all the noise and the hype that we tend to put out and for youth events and so on. But they're looking for substance. And uh, that's one very important thing. And second thing the article also shared was one of the biggest challenges, of course, is mental health. Uh, uh, that perhaps because of whatever they've gone through, and perhaps of the uh, everything that's happening on online, mental health has become a big issue for this generation. That's what we're talking about: the youth, eighty to twenty-five, <clears throat> the 20, twenty year olds. So, so what we are doing now is to begin to address topics and we can actually invite them for an intelligent time. So, um, uh, for example, right now when we are doing the, the sermon series on faith and science, we are actually promoting that in college campuses. So, you know, posters have gone up in over eight, nine college campuses. Uh, we are uh, intensely promoting this event to college campuses, college students, so that when they come, they can come and listen. They can say the church is the church is talking about faith and science. You know, so it's talking about something intelligent. It's not just, you know, hype and noise, but the church is addressing questions that we have. And similarly we need to, you know, think about addressing 
issues concerning mental health and so on, because that's a very important priority for this generation. So I've just shared with you, you know, some of our past experience in reaching youth and how things are changing with time. And we also need to adapt our youth ministry towards these things. Um, so let me pause here and uh, just take up, uh, uh, you know, uh, any other thoughts that you have here uh, on, on the youth. Um, any of your experiences, anything that you may be doing, so on. Uh, let's, I'm reading Asha's comment here in the chat. Reaching out to children is so precious. I love the innocent mind. They are open. Things are allowed to reach out to them in the future by doing activities and games. Wonderful. Connect them to the Father's heart. Amen. Charles, last week I conducted VBS. Wonderful. All right. Okay, so thank you. Uh, anybody wants to share? We have a couple of minutes. Uh, just about youth, your experience, um, you know, I shared a little bit about our story. I'd love to hear your story uh, from your, your place, your part of the world. Anybody wants to share anything? Go ahead, Charles. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we conduct a, a youth, uh, youth training. Uh, we we mentor them in church ministry, especially they are usually provided by the church because the church writes a recommendation, sending them to our training. The training is called the Christian Youth in Action. We expect every youth that comes is already Christian. So uh, we bring them for 10 days. We do a pre-training for five days. And then the next five days, they, we organize for them areas where they can meet children and then they meet them. They are able to minister to them every day for five days, an mm -hmm. hour a day. And then there are those uh, part uh, that form the teams. They are called open air team. These ones also go out with an instructor. Then they meet the children on boreholes sports areas and uh, those that are walking on the road are like that so we do it every year for 10 10 days and mm. for four years a student graduates uh, having completed the children's ministry and then they are able to be placed in areas of influence thank you mm -hmm. interesting thank you for sharing that charles so you do to have so these are children from different churches, youth from different churches who are coming together. Yes, they come from different churches. Mm, wonderful. So glad that you have this um, great opportunity to, you know, to impact uh, the youth and then get them ready for them impacting others uh, in, in their future. Amazing. Uh, and it's, a, it's so good to know that you have youth coming from different churches that you can work with. And that's really good. It's really good. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? Um, working with youth ages 18 to 25. So can I? Please go ahead, Rupa. Oh, thank you, Pastor. Oh, we are uh, in a place where we are surrounded by universities. Our, our house is just opposite to JNT Engineering College mm. in this Anantapur district, uh, Anantapur, and uh, and there is a Krishna Devaraya University and few colleges around. So uh, this is a rented house God gave us, and we moved to this place in 2013. Uh, but uh, we opened our home for the students to come and have their Bible studies in our house. Mm. Uh, the JNT college students and different people who are need place because in some universities now they can't uh, have Bible studies inside mm. the uh, campuses. So we have opened our home from then on. And I'm also working, helping the USA <coughs> uh, ministry, that student ministry they do in this place and uh, go to medical colleges 
and uh, nursing schools where uh, we meet with the children there and have Bible studies, regular Bible studies. Mm -hmm. There's not much singing and all that because we have to do it very quietly. In some places, we are not even supposed to carry the Bible, just go there inside and share. And mm -hmm. that's how we were working, sir, till mm -hmm. COVID started. Now, after that, it's online. Till now. now, slowly, they're trying to again meet physically mm -hmm. and uh, reach out to the children mm -hmm. we build up a rapport because it's a hope and home it's like uh, they can come down anytime share their heart share a meal so and in that way we can mentor them and help them uh, any medical need or uh, financial need sometimes they come from a hindu background and a poor background so we can help them, show them avenues where they can help, get help. And so, mm -hmm. so that's how we are able to help the youth in this place. Mm. Very nice. Thank Very nice. You. Thank you for sharing that. And that's, um, that's really special that you're able to, you know, open up your home and <clears throat> so that these college students can come. And uh, yeah, and of course, I know because of COVID, Work had to be stopped. You know, as, as you, you resume, may the Lord just increase your influence and just draw people in. Wonderful. All right, I'll take a moment to read uh, Susan Nirmal's uh, note. She, um, I take teenager, teenagers meeting age 13 to 19 offline, sometimes online. You do games, uh, take them out. Memor give them words, memorize Bible stories, and teach them to pray for others. Wonderful. Great to hear that, Susan. Keep it up. All right. So um, thanks for sharing each one. Thanks for sharing your experiences, what you're doing. You know, and I want to encourage you that as you begin to think about urban church planting, starting a ministry, it means that we are strategic in reaching different age groups you know and start thinking that way pray and the lord uh, will give us ideas and also open up doors right we'll be continue this tomorrow let's close in prayer um, anybody could just close in prayer and dismiss us please pastor can i pray Go ahead. our gracious and everlasting father we want to give you praise and honor for this great opportunity that you have granted us this morning and this day father we pray committing ourselves into your hands oh god that the, the inspiring messages that we have shared we pray that you grant us the grace to be able to continue in our various ministries in the mighty name of jesus mm. father those that we are birthing in us the ideas that you are giving us through this interaction we pray that you grant us the grace to start in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray that you grant each of us a burden to reach out to children and to young people in our generation, mm -hmm. that we will keep on expanding your kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. Continue to supply us with great grace that we will be able to do more in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good afternoon, rest of the day. Uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. God bless. Thank you for sharing. Bye now. Bye. God bless. Thank you, Pastor.